with this world we're living in, a world full of challenges and uncertainty, actually, a world post-pandemic, full of geopolitical tensions, uh, debt crisis, energy crisis, um, disruptions in, uh, on uh, uh, chain supply, etc. Just name it. So what can emerge from this in a world, in terms of world order? This session is going to be very disappointing for the audience because, I mean, one could expect the visionary or the academic to come and say what is going to, to happen in the, in the future. So if you, if you look at the, the World Risk Report that was published by the World Economic Forum at the beginning of this year in Davos, the world executives, they have stated that the key challenges for the world are the ones that you have mentioned, climate change, mm -hmm. uh, geopolitical issues, food security, and, and so on. Uh, and I have two comments to make about that. The first one is that if you look at the 2019 report, the statements were exactly the same. So in 2019, if you look at the World Risk Report published by the World Economic Forum, executives said again, that the risks for the world would be a food security, geopolitical crisis, and, and a sustainability. The point I'm trying to make is that we are a disaster at making forecasts, and we keep on making them. And I think if you look at the, the big themes that, the, that are going to be relevant, they are relevant, obviously. This is what I call the great rhinos. You know, everybody mm. sees them. We know that we need to tackle them like the sustainability crisis, the climate crisis, uh, all of the other geopolitical issues, but the, the issues that are going to change the world mm -hmm. are totally unpredictable. I call this the era of ignorance, in the sense that I don't know what is going to happen in the coming years that is going to change the world. Mm -hmm. We need to be prepared. But in general, they say about. that um, pandemics and wars are turning points in history in general. Exactly. But wars and pandemics were in the past, but why now we say it's unprecedented? Hmm. Why we fail, we failed and we're still failing to uh, predict in hmm. which direction the world and the world order is going? Hmm. I, I think there are, and, and I have a, a lot of, I, I'm in a business school, so I, I, lo, I mm -hmm. have a lot of experience with corporate executives, and I'm old enough already to have seen this coming repeatedly. I think there are two mistakes that executives and politicians make. One is we extrapolate a lot. Mm -hmm. That is, we look at what has happened in the past. I mean, in 2019, for example, if you remember, we had the fires, the wildfires in Australia. Yes. We had natural catastrophes in India, in California. So when you ask executives what is the major risk for the world, they mention uh, environmental disasters. Mm -hmm. So we extrapolate a lot. And the second mistake is that we don't learn from our mistakes. We don't go back in time and then we say, what did we say in 2015 that our scenarios were? And actually, when you do that exercise, you consistently see that the scenarios that we set are totally wrong. Pessimistic scenarios are never pessimistic enough, and optimistic scenarios are never optimistic enough. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a very fatalistic in that, in that perspective, and I think my, my approach is that we need to be prepared for the unthinkable much more than trying to predict what is going to be happening. Mm -hmm. Can we be prepared, Dr. Samir? What do you think? Can we be prepared if we fail to predict what's going on in the world order or the world in general? You know, I think uh, one way of looking at where we are today is to try to examine who has stakes in the world today and what are the drivers of those stakes. Clearly, you could make an assessment that the United States does not necessarily believe it needs to invest as much as it did in the past in the mm -hmm. order that exists today. Mm -hmm. You know, from its uh, responses during the pandemic, from its uh, role in various crises around the world, from mm -hmm. its current economic posture, including the IRA, which is quite nationalist in, 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 in its uh, dimensions. Um, it's a gentler version of make America great again. Uh, but if you look at 
the American fatigue with the world order, it's quite clear that they have now reached a point where they do not believe they need to invest as much to sustain it. The Chinese believe that they need to reshape the world order because the one that exists does not serve the purpose of Beijing. Mm -hmm. The Russians believe that they have to oppose the world order no matter who makes it because that is their business model. So the question that really exists is that who has the most amount of stake in the world of the future and therefore are there new actors who are willing to invest in it. And I truly believe that South Asia, the Middle East, or West Asia as we call it in India, and other parts of the, of the emerging world, from Indonesia to South Africa to countries in Latin America, we will have to step up. We can no longer be complaining from the sidelines. We know the Americans are not going to be the good actors they were. We know the Chinese love being different actors. We know Russian like being bad actors. We will have to create coalitions and partnerships that will have to build the world order. The pandemic, as you mentioned, it was a cry out loud that the world order as we know it is no longer functioning. You know, we had the best institutions that we had invested for in seven decades. We had reports that said that the cities that are most competent to respond to the pandemic would be New York and London. You know, those reports were rubbish, the institutions are rubbish. And we are trying to continue to sustain an international system that has failed us for the last two decades. The 21st century has been an ungoverned century. It is time we build the institutions for this century. And we, in this region, in the Indo-Pacific, as the previous speaker mentioned, will have to invest our resources, will have to invest our time, and we cannot believe that someone else will come and do it for us. It is time to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Prof. Arturo, no, and what so, are the main challenges? But, but you know, so I, I, mm -hmm. I agree, and, but of course, the question is, how, how is this transition going to happen? I mean, I, I agree, totally agree that the world order, the way it is built today, doesn't make any sense. That is, it's not in line with the economic powers like India, Brazil, or Germany, you know, that they don't have a, they don't have a, a massive role in the, in the international order. But to me, the big question is, so how we are going to go through this transform? It has to be, it cannot be gradual. It has to be, has to be driven by a, part, for, by a certain shock that will happen. So now we will reconsider this entire no, so if your question is mm -hmm. that this period could be turbulent, could have violence, yes. could have conflicts, we are already living it. Yeah. I think the last, the last five or six years tell us that we are going through a rather turbulent phase. Mm -hmm. We have lost a large part of humankind to the pandemic because we were all selfish, we, did, we were not willing to share, we were not willing to cre use the global institutions to deliver uh, responses to different parts of the world. We have lost people. Now, how much more bloodshed do we need to understand that the, the transition is upon us? Now, are we going to see a big war? I think that's the hidden dimension. Are we mm -hmm. going to see a, a, a large conflict that is going to mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. reset uh, those who sit on the high table? I hope not. But you know, history may not repeat itself, it certainly rhymes. Mm -hmm. And there is always a chance that if we are not wise enough, we may decide to normalize the use of force as the, as the form of dialogue. Mm -hmm. I hope we have learned as humankind over the last 75 years. I hope we have become wiser. I hope we are able to at least have conversations. Now, what happens in Europe does not give me hope. I see two sides wanting to continue to fight forever. I just don't hear sane voices um, seeking peace, seeking off-ramps, seeking pathways to solutions. I, I see on Twitter, and by the way, mm. Twitter decides the mood of governments and mood of policies. Unfo unfortunately, uh, social media is today the, the global governance framework that we live with. We have to be very careful that we have to reclaim the space, allow uh, adult conversations inside rooms, to create paths, pathways that are sensible. I worry we may be heading to a conflict. Europe is a sign that no one seems to be uh, investing in peace. Uh, I hope the old continent does not infect the new world again. Uh, Europe has damaged the world many times over. And I hope this time uh, sensible European heads can, can resolve their problems. You know, uh, I remember them coming and telling us in different parts of the world that be sensible, mm. be rational, be mature, be patient. I think we all have to go there and say this to Europe now. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it is time for us to take a delegation, multi-country delegation and go and tell the Europeans that, you know, mm -hmm. this is what you told us over the last five decades. Now I'm going to replay it back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope Europe gets its act together. Do it is not looking good. Yeah, Dr. Mm -hmm. Samir, because I want to hear from uh, Professor Arturo from mm. this. Is this all Europe's or the West's problem? Are we going to like a West's, uh, East uh, mm -hmm. tensions, multipolar order system? Where are we heading and what's yeah. mm -hmm. likely to go wrong and possibly right mm -hmm. in the facts we are dealing with and yeah. the challenges we are dealing with? Some of them are existential. Mm -hmm. so, so I think my answer has to go a little bit with the point that you have made. And I think as European, I should come to the rescue uh, because I strongly believe uh, and I have been convinced about that for already decades that actually Europe is the answer to the future of the world mm -hmm. rather than the problem. First of all, the type of fragmentation that you see today in Europe is not different from the fragmentation that you see in Southeast Asia. Correct. I mean, India's opinion about the world order and Singaporean opinion, they're not, they not the same. So there is a fragmentation also in Latin America. You know, for example, the divide with respect to the war in Ukraine between Brazil and Chile is, is profound. So I think this fragmentation exists. I think Europe is the answer, because if you look at, for example, these two big themes that are in discussion today, technology and sustainability, first of all, on the sustainability front, we are following, actually, European lead in sustainability, versus, for example, China and the United States. On technology, we had a panel yesterday about data and data security. You know, we have these two systems of how we deal with technology that are private sector driven in the United States, state driven in China, and then in the middle you have Europe with a governance system for data that is to me a, a, role, a role model. So I think that we have problems in Europe. I, I don't feel responsible for the mistakes of my grandparents. But I think that we are going to lead the, the, the transformation of the world in the coming decade. Because at the end of the day, we were discussing that earlier. If you look at the institutional arrangements that we have anywhere in the world, they are European. I mean, if you go to the Shanghai uh, Symphonic Orchestra, you will not play, you will not see them playing like a an Ahu, which is a traditional Chinese violin. They play the Italian violin. So I think we have Euro and, and I didn't expect to do this, but I think Europe has fantastic institutions. We have problems, but you know, we, I think, also are somehow the hope as well. No, I'm, I'm glad you're optimistic, Professor. I think uh, we are betting on Europe as well, but Europe that we see today needs to in answer two big questions. Uh, and I think you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. The first is, which is the real Europe? Mm -hmm. And Europe today is caught between a number of different tendencies. There is an east-west divide. Are we moving towards a Europe that will be organized around a Warsaw 2.0? Mm -hmm. So are we going to see an Eastern European yes. center that is going to define the political muscle and the political posture of Europe? And are we going to see that shift from Berlin and Paris to to, to Bucharest and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Warsaw. Yeah. That's one big question that Europe needs to answer. And the second, I think Europe needs to make a choice. Is it offering a third path, a different way mm -hmm. to either the US or China? Or is it going to be promiscuous and sometimes side with US uh, and sometimes side with China? Mm -hmm. I see Europe not offering a third path. I see Europe making convenient choices, sometimes choosing the Chinese uh, way of, of doing business, sometimes choosing the American uh, political but, but, systems. But in general, Dr. And, Samir, do you think things are going in favor of Asia? Because in terms of um, uh, India or China, what to expect from them in the world order or the next world order? Uh, they have like very economic potentials, of course, and their uh, political influence uh, is getting like growing uh, from no, time to time with, the, with time, mm -hmm. but at the same time they have their own uh, challenges and Correct. problems in terms of corruption, for example, uh, unemployment, um, older uh, population in China, for example. 
No, so, I, you know, I, I think there is a trend which moves um, both economic opportunity and political power towards the East. Mm -hmm. It is also happening in Europe. European, Western European power is mm -hmm. moving to East Europe. Uh, the world power is moving to East Asia and, and to the Eastern Hemisphere more generally. Um, on China and India, since you use those two countries, uh, since you invoked the names, I think interesting trends. China is going to be less efficient than we think it is. Mm -hmm. It is going to become more clumsy as it becomes bigger and more important for all of us. We have seen signs of it. It is not that perfect machine that we thought it was. It makes mistakes, it stumbles, and with that size, when it makes mistakes, it implicates all of us. So we are going to see China, even as it rises, become more influential and problematic at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's going to be one reality. And I'm not uh, uh, really talking about politics here. I'm talking about the nature of China's future growth. Mm -hmm. India, despite its, large, uh, its rather loud democracy and sometimes, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, emotional democracy, you are going to see a compelling economic growth that is again going to implicate the world. It is going to decide the future of sustainability. It is going to decide the future of climate action. It is going to decide key mm. questions on, on, on political stability, on food security, and of course, mm. on one-sixth of humanity. Now, both of these countries are going to be unlike the West. The mm. largest chunk of global economic power is going to be in two countries who, the, who have not been part of writing the old order. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is going to be pressures on global institutions mm -hmm. who are not designed to accommodate these very two unique actors that are coming mm -hmm. up. My optimism or the possibility that I see is that in the days ahead, we are going to move away from the uh, clunky assessments through the prisms of nation states. And we are going to be looking at regions and cities who are going to be defining the future of the world. And clearly, it could be Ahmedabad, Bombay, Shanghai, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. You're going to have a cluster of 15 or 20 economic and political centers that are going mm -hmm. to create a whole new networked architecture of global governance. And the nation state framework is going to continue to underperform simply because uh, the politics that emerges from countries is always zero sum. It's always the lowest common denominator. So cities give me optimism and I'm one of the cities that gives me optimism as well. I have a comment about, I think I'm answering, answering your question, but is defining the blocks actually is going to be very difficult because it's not East versus West. It's not democracy versus non-democracies. It's not a, you know, importing versus exporting countries. So it's a, it's a, we need new definitions, essentially. Yes, thank you very much. Thank this you. is the end of uh, this session. Uh, Prof. Arturo Briz, Director IMD, uh, Ford Competitiveness Center. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Samir Saran, thank President of, of the Observer thank Research you. Foundation. Thank you for your time mm -hmm. and uh, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.